Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear viewers, from today I begin this lecture series on the collection and transmission history of the Quran. It is primarily based on a 15 year long research, part of which also formed my doctoral thesis. It primarily owes its inception to the questions that arose in my mind when I taught this subject to postgraduate students and I taught the conventional view on the collection and transmission of the Quran. And then as I taught and studied this subject, more questions arose in my mind and I made a commitment to myself that I shall try my best to find out the truth behind these questions. Today in this session, I shall present some of the important questions which arose in my mind uh, 15 years ago. And I shall also try, inshallah, to sum up these questions as best as I can. And then in the later episodes of this topic, I shall also point out the research methodology, my objective, and a summary of the topics that we shall discuss later on. But first, as I said, in this session, I'll present before you the questions which arose in my mind at that time. The first question which arose in my mind uh, when I began studying and teaching the subject was that currently there are five different versions of the Quran found in the Muslim Ummah. Now, this might be a startling revelation for most of you, but then for academic circles, this is nothing new. So we have five different versions of the Quran circulating in the Muslim Ummah. We have this famous version, or I would say the Rivaya of Hafs from Asim, uh, which is the Quran, uh, which is taught in most parts of the Muslim Ummah and which is known to most of us. And these Qurans, as I would point out, are actually named after a, a famous reciter, which, who used to recite the Quran in a particular way. And when I say reciter, it does not mean, it does not merely refer to pronunciation. It also refers to variation in words. So when I say there are five versions, it means that there are five different versions which have different words at times. There are verbs which are different. There are nouns which are different. There is a difference between a plural and singular. There is a difference between declensions or the Arab. And then we have other differences as well. So the first of these Qur'ans, as I said, which, is, which circulates in most of the Muslim Ummah is called the Rivaya of Hafs from Asim. And the second of these uh, versions is called the Rivaya of Warsh and Nafi. And uh, this is also, uh, uh, this, this Quran circulates in most parts of Morocco and Algeria, and almost all of, in fact, Morocco and Algeria read the Quran on the Rivaya of Warsh from Nafi. Warsh and Nafi, and as I, as I previously said, Hafs and Asim, all these are reciters. Hafs is the student of, uh, of uh, Asim, and similarly, Warsh is a student of Nafi. And uh, uh, Asim lived or died in 127 Hijra, and uh, Nafi himself died in 169 Hijra. The third version uh, of the Quran, which is uh, prevalent in most parts of uh, Libya and Tunisia, it is called the Rivaya of Kalun from Nafi. Now, uh, Nafi, again, he had two students. The previous version was from Warsh, and this is from his other student, Kalun. So this is the third version of the Quran. Now, the fourth version of the Quran is found in uh, parts of Sudan. And this is called the Rivaya of Ad-Duri from Abu Amr. Abu Amr is also uh, another reciter of the Quran. And may I also point out that uh, Asim himself lived in Kufa and Nafi in Medina. And, Bas and Abu Amr, of whose Qirat I'm just mentioning, whose Qirat I'm just mentioning, he's lived in Basra. And as I said, his uh, Quran is found in most parts of Sudan. And finally, we have uh, the Quran of Hisham. He, he, the Rivaya of Hisham from the Qirat of, uh, of, of uh, Abdullah ibn Amir. Abdullah ibn Amir mm, was uh, a, a reciter of Damascus, and he died in 118 Hijra. So these are five different versions of the Quran circulating in the Muslim Ummah currently. And as I said, uh, there are the differences in, this, in these versions is not just in matters of pronunciation or dial or accent, but it, it also relates to differences in word patterns, differences in nouns, different in a singular or plural uh, noun, and similarly in declensions or arab. And then there are differences in particles also. For example, at, at uh, places we'll have wow or a, or a fa uh, in a difference of opinion. And uh, just to give you an example uh, that uh, the differences which we are f which are found in these uh, in these. Uh, uh, various versions. So, for example, the f I, I, if I categorize these differences, although these these categories which I have made are not exhaustive, but mm, some of the categories uh, which can give you some idea of these differences is 
that uh, in one version we find the words, as you can see, being displayed on your screen, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ And the, in the other version we'll find, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ So we find the word huwa is missing in one of them. Similarly, there is uh, this uh, difference in singular and plural nouns. So uh, the first of these uh, verses which I cited was Surah Hadid's uh, 24th verse. And now I, I will cite Surah Tahrim's 12th verse. And the words of this verse uh, in one of the versions is, وَصَدَّكَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْكَانِتِينَ And the words in another version are, وَصَدَّكَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكِتَابِهِ وَكِتَابِهِ In the previous we had the plural kutub and now we have kitab. وَكِتَابِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ And then we have also the differences in verb patterns. For example, in Surah, one verse of Surah Araf, is verse 141, the words are, is And in other version, the words are, And then again, we have a difference in declensions or the Arab. And uh, in Surah Lahab, the fourth verse reads uh, in most versions as, why some of some versions say hamma la tulhatab, so uh, it is declined in the nominative, while the first one is declined in the accusative. So uh, all in all, we can see that there is a difference in these uh, in these areas. And if you ask me that, uh, does this difference change the meaning of the Quran as well? I will say yes. In many cases, it does change the meaning. And uh, although the change might be very minor and it might not be of, uh, in, uh, of much significance, but again, it, it does change the meaning. And in some cases, there is a drastic change in meaning as well. For example, in the, on, in the Tayammum or in the, the Wuzu verse of uh, Surah Maida, which is the sixth verse of Surah Maida, uh, if it is read in a particular way uh, in, during ablution, we would not need to wash our feet. Uh, to, to wipe them would be sufficient, to do masa on them would be sufficient. So if we read the verse as arju lakum ilal karbain, the way it is found in, in some of the versions, then we'll have to wash our feet. But if we read it as, uh, as arju lakum, then we would not need to wash our feet, merely wiping them or do, doing masa on them would be sufficient if we are doing wuzu. So you can see that there is a difference in the directives as well. Now the question which now arises is that if there are five versions of the Qur'an circulating in this Muslim Ummah, then which one is the correct one? Or should we say that all of them are correct? So this was the first question that struck me and obviously uh, when I'll present my research, uh, in my humble opinion, I'll present the answer to this question. But as I said, today I'm just enumerating these questions, just enlisting these questions. And the first of them, as I said, uh, which wonder struck me and dumbfounded me was that there are five, at least five versions. And uh, uh, I'm saying this uh, because uh, there are other versions also which are classically accepted. But that I leave to the next point. The next point is, uh, the, or the next question actually, which arose in my mind, also relates uh, perhaps to the first question. But it is an independent question because of its import. So uh, the second question is that uh, there are variant multiple readings of the Quran. The Quran can be read in various ways, in multiple ways. And uh, why? Uh, because uh, our scholars say that these multiple ways uh, have been sanctioned by the Prophet. But when they say this, they do not cite any criteria from the Prophet. But what they do is they cite their own criteria in this regard. And they say that if any reading of the Quran, any recital of the Quran is sanctioned by three criteria, then it can be accepted as a verse of the Qur'an. That particular recital will be a verse of the Qur'an. And these three criteria are very, very famous. And any person who has even a slight knowledge of the Qiraat um, science, he, would, uh, he, he knows that uh, a Qiraat or a reading should be uh, in accordance with the rules of the Arabic grammar. And then it should be uh, reliably traced back to the, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the third criteria is that it should be in accordance with any of the Usmanic copies. So any reading, any recital, which is in consonance with these three criteria is regarded as acceptable. And may I show you, viewers, that 
uh, if I uh, show you this Quran before me and I open up any page of the Quran, you'll find on, on, on its sides on the, uh, that you, the other variant readings of a particular verse which is mentioned in the main text uh, are, are mentioned uh, in the margins. And you can see that there's hardly a page in this whole corpus of the Quran which is devoid of any variation in this reading. And this variation in reading, again, as I said, is basically uh, acceptable to all our scholars if these readings conform to these standards which I have just narrated before you. And viewers, also interesting is the fact that these, uh, these uh, uh, readings, as I said, at times they do not have a very significant change uh, in the meaning, but at many a time we have significant changes in the meaning as well. Because when words change, when, the, when we find that there is a difference in declensions, in the verb patterns, in nouns, the mean, meaning obviously changes. And just to quote a very uh, glaring example, in again uh, the same verse, uh, Surah Maida's sixth verse, we find that in the case of dry ablution or tayammum, uh, now one verse has the words awla mastumun nisa, or I would say most versions, uh, which means that if uh, men have had intercourse with their wife, with their wives, and they find no, uh, they don't find water for ablution, then they can do tayammum. However, in one of the other versions, which is uh, of one of the other recitals, which is uh, attributed to Hamza, uh, a famous reciter of, of Kufa, uh, the words are lamastumun nisa, which means that this is only allowed if uh, a husband has kissed or touched his wife and uh, then he finds no water and he, then he can do dry ablution. So in La Mastumun Nisa, the version which says La Mastumun Nisa, it would mean that dry ablution is allowed in the case of sexual intercourse between a husband and wife. But in the case, in the, if the verse is read as La Mastumun Nisa, that is without an alif, it would mean that only, it is only allowed if they have kissed or touched each other. So you can see that uh, merely this variation produces a difference in directives as well. So the question arises that uh, if we have to accept any recital as the Quran, the obvious question which, which, could, which would come in my mind would be that it has to be sanctioned by the Almighty or by his Prophet. Now, lo and behold, here we find neither, neither the Almighty nor the Prophet sanctioning these recitals uh, or not giving any criteria of accepting these recitals. These criteria have been formed by our scholars of the Ummah. When I say these three criteria, it means that these three criteria have not been given to us by the Almighty, not been given to us by the Prophet Muhammad wasallam himself. It is the scholars of the Ummah who say that any recital, any reading of the Quran, any qiraat of the Quran, if it conforms to these three standards, then it shall be held acceptable. So as I said, the question which arose in my mind is that why? Only God and his Prophet should be given or has been given or invested with this authority of regarding anything to do with the Quran. So how can we regard something which a scholar of, of the Quran who is perhaps a, a hundred or two hundred years, who lives a hundred or two hundred years after the revelation of the Quran, who has given him the authority to decide what the Quran is and what it is not. The third question viewers which arose in my mind <clears throat> is regarding uh, in, in certain narratives which are found in our canonical hadith books, which give us this very, very stark impression that the Quran we have today with us is incomplete. The Quran we have today with us is not complete, it is imperfect. It has uh, something which has been left out. Uh, and I can uh, quote many examples, but mm, for the uh, lack of time, I would content myself in citing two very common examples which are perhaps uh, known uh, to any student of the Quran who has studied the history of the Quran. So uh, the, th the third question, as I said, which struck my mind and which uh, caused a lot of doubt in my mind was that we have this impression that the Quran we have today is not complete. Now the first of these verses is the stoning verse, uh, which is found in, uh, uh, in Bukhari. Uh, it's also found in the in Muatta of Imam Malik, but the version that I am now uh, presenting before you uh, is, is a hadith which is from Sunan of Ibn Majah. And you can see that the words are very startling and which tell us that a particular verse of the Quran had been left out from the Quran and it, is not, it still exists 
in certain ahadith and uh, it was part of the Quran but it no longer is part of the Quran and let me also point out the fact that no other person than Umar ibn al-Khattab himself has, uh, is, he is the person who narrates this hadith. So um, the uh, words as recorded in the Sunnah of Ibn Majah are قَالَ أُمْرُ بِالْخَطَّابِ لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ أَنْ يَتُولَ بِالنَّا زَمَانِ حَتَّى يَقُولَ قَائِلٌ مَا أَجْدُ الرَّجَمْ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَيَذِلُّ بِتَرْكِ فَرِيدَةٍ مِنْ فَرَائِذِ اللَّهِ أَلَا وَإِنَّ الرَّجَمْ حَقٌ إِذَا أُحْسِنَ الرَّجُلْ وَقَامَتِ الْبَيِّنَ أَوْ كَانَ حَمْلٌ أَوْ اِعْتِرَافٌ وَقَدْ قَرَأْتُهَا الشَّيْخُ وَالشَّيْخَةُ إِذَا زَنَيَا فَرْجُمُوهُمَا أَلْبَتَّتَا رَجَمَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم ورجمنا بعد Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I fear the time will pass over people until someone will say, I do not find the words of stoning in the book of God. So in this way, people will be led astray by abandoning a directive from, the, from other directives or from among the directives of God. Bear in mind that stoning is the rightful punishment for a married person who has committed adultery. And it is established through evidence or pregnancy or confession. And I have read this, this is the verse which Umar said has been left out from the Quran. And it means necessarily stoned to death the married man and the married woman guilty of adultery. So this is what the conventional translation of this word is. God's messenger stoned criminals for this crime and so did we after him. So this is the verse of the Quran which is operational today on which uh, on the basis of which punishments are given today by our conventional scholars the way they understand it but it is no longer found in the Quran. Another example here is the suckling verse and this I cite, this hadith I cite from the Sahih of Imam Muslim and here the, this hadith has been cited by none other than Aisha ta'ala anha. So the words are An Aisha ta'annaha qalat kana fima unzila min quran ashru raza'atin ma'lumat uh, uh, Aisha stated, Among what was revealed in the Quran was that ten known suckling drops of milk of a, uh, uh, of a child will make him a foster son and hence make him prohibited to marry. Later, this was abrogated in a verse which mentioned five known drops, God's messenger died and the verse which mentioned these five drops was among what was being read from the Quran. So Aisha anha is supposedly saying that what makes a person as a foster, uh, foster son or a foster child is, the, is a suckling verse which says that ten drops of milk when they are uh, when they are drunk by a child and he becomes a foster child and she says that this was abrogated by another verse in which instead of 10 drops they were, It was mentioned that five drops of milk are sufficient to make a child as, as a foster child and What she says which is uh, something which is very eye-catching is She says that the Prophet died the Prophet died and this word, this verse was among those that was being read from the Quran. And viewers, we know that today's Quran no longer contains this verse. So the words are, Wahunna fima yukrao min Quran. These verses from among the Quran were from among the Quran when the Prophet died. And we obviously, as I said, these no longer exist. So these two are very uh, prominent and glaring examples which testify to the fact that. Uh, the Quran which we have today, if we, if, if we go by these narratives, is incomplete. So as I said, this was the third question which struck me when I began my research. The fourth question which confronted me in this regard was that as I read through various research manuals and histories of the Quran, I found, and obviously this is something which is of established nature, that the Quran we have today has scribal errors scriptural errors, errors in the script, and we find that these are numerous. Thus, for example, we have uh, extra vowels mentioned in various places which are regarded as redundant. They are written, but they are regarded as redundant by the oral tradition. We have extra alifs 
we have extra uh, yas and we have extra vavs. And uh, just to give you a few examples uh, as they are being displayed before you on the screen, uh, this is verse of Surah Naml has uh, extra alif contained in it. Uh, the words are la azibannahu azaban shadida aw la azbahannahu. As you can see, the underlined word, uh, the uh, the alif which uh, which uh, actually succeeds the other alif is an extra alif because the word is la azbahannahu. Or uh, if we don't uh, accept this to be a redundant, uh, to be something a letter which is redundant, then uh, we find this anomaly that this word would this verse or this word would read in a very opposite way, and the words would be awla azbahanna. It, it will be a negative particle instead of presenting the positive uh, picture. Similarly, another example is from Surah Al Imran. This is verse 158, and here again we find an extra alif. Uh, the words are The first of these alif uh, uh, is, uh, or the second of these alif is redundant, uh, and uh, it has to it has to be subtracted from reading or deleted from reading. Otherwise, uh, we'll have an opposite meaning. Sharun would mean that uh, it is it is for sure that people uh, shall be gathered before the Almighty. But if we read it with the second alif as well. Then the words would become la ilallah, and we shall not people or you should not be gathered before the Almighty. So you can see there is an exactly opposite meaning, and the question is that uh, uh, scholars generally say that the oral tradition shall rule uh, the written tradition, and these these scribal errors uh, shall be regarded or shall be disregarded. Uh, but again, the question arises that uh, uh, was not the Quran checked for these scribal errors whenever it was written, or should we say that the uh, oral tradition uh, perhaps uh, was correcting the written tradition or the interesting scenario that it was the written tradition was, which was correct and the oral tradition which was wrongly reported. So all these questions do arise. But as I said, this is just a one example. Another example, uh, uh, and I, this time I'll confine myself to a single example, is uh, the existence of an extra ya. So you can see the word of Surah Zariyat before you, the words, uh, the words 47. The words are was sama abanaynaha bi aidin wa inna lamusiyun. The word aid obviously means hand. You can see that there are two yas in that in that word. It has it should have only, should have had only a single ya, but we find that there are two yas. And strangely enough, and uh, quite amusingly, we find some of our mufassirun, some of our exegetes saying since that since the hand of God is being referred to here, so therefore we have two yas here. Uh, obviously, this is something of a of more more of an amusement and. Than, uh, than anything which can be uh, nearer to reality. And the third example yours in this is that we find an extra vav uh, in mentioned in, in, in many places. And, and a single example that I'm going to quote before you is verse 45 of Surah Araf, which is being displayed before you. As you can see, the words are Saurikum dar al fasiqeen. And the vav here after in Saurikum is redundant, is, 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 has no basis, it is just there and it has no function. So you can see, viewers, that these are just a few examples which I have given. Other than uh, the, uh, these examples, uh, there are numerous examples in which we can see these scribal errors in which an extra va or extra ya or an extra alif is found in, in these uh, uh, versions of the Quran. And it is not just the Quran that we have today. Even the earliest versions of the Quran have these scribal errors. So the question, of, obviously, which arises in our mind is that why does the Quran have these scribal errors? Now, the, the, the fifth question which arises, which arose in my mind at that time when I conducted my study and uh, studied um, more deeply this subject, was that we know that in the times of the Caliph Usman, ta'ala anhu, uh, he had made copies of the Quran and he had sent them to various parts of his empire so that uh, his duty as a disseminator of the Quran, he can fulfill that duty. Now, viewers, uh, I was struck by this question because our source books say, one of, most of them say, almost all of them say, that these versions or these copies of the Quran, which Usman made in his times, were different from each other. Now, the story goes, or the, or the traditional account says, that Abu Bakr Anhuk had collected the Quran in his times in a single volume, and, Umar, and Usman Anhu in his times, he summoned that copy, and then he made further copies from that copy. Now, one would obviously expect that if copies 
are being made from a Quran, then they have to be true copies. They have to reflect exactly what the original copy said. And we also know that the original copy uh, was, a, was a single version of the Quran. But we are struck again by this question. But when Usman made these copies, it is Allah Anhu, there were variations in these copies. There were differences in these copies. They were not, this, they were not reflecting what the original Quran of Abu Bakr uh, was, uh, had written in it. But we find that there are variations. And I counted once that there are at least 60 variations uh, between these various versions as they have been uh, given to us by our worthy scholars. And just to give you a few examples, uh, it is said in the Kufan and the Basran Codex of the Quran, which Usman sent, uh, the words of Surah Baqarah's ayat, uh, uh, verse 132 are, Ibrahim. The words are, Ibrahim. However, in the Medinan Codex, the words are, Ibrahim. Again, we find this difference, this variation. So the question is, what exactly was written in Abu Bakr's version? Was it Wassa or was it Awsa? If it is Wassa, why was another copy made with Awsa? And if it, is, it was Awsa, then why was a copy made with Wassa? And obviously, uh, viewers, we could not have seen uh, both these words written uh, on, on, the, on, on that Quran because we, we, we find that Abu Bakr's version was of basically a single Quran or a single version of the Quran. Similarly, viewers, in the Madinan and the Basran Codex, the words were, However, in the Kufan Codex, which Usman sent to, the, to, to Kufa, the words were, So in the, in, in the Basran and the Madinan Codex, the words were, husna, the, 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 the last word was, husna, And in the, uh, in the Kufan Codex, it was, Ihsana. And again, another example, in the Iraqi Codex, the words were, But in the Syrian Codex, the words are, uh, So we have a difference of words. In, in the Iraqi Codex, the words were, And in the Syrian Codex, the words are, So this was the fifth question which, uh, which confounded me, that why were copies of the Quran uh, in the times of Usman, different from one another, and he even sanctioned them. Uh, the sixth question which arose in my mind uh, at that time was that uh, the, basically the accounts of the collection of the Quran and in their, its transmission have been mentioned in our Ulum al-Quran books. And uh, these Ulum al-Quran books uh, obviously reflect our history. But then again, these Ulum al-Quran books are basically uh, recounting what, what our initial Hadith books have uh, have mentioned uh, have been, uh, what has been mentioned in these of these books. Thus, for example, Imam Bukhari's Al Jami al Sahih or Imam Muslim's Al Jami al Sahih, uh, and the rest of the six canonical uh, rest of of the canonical books, whatever has been mentioned in them, they are basically our sources of the collection of the Quran narratives as well as its transmission. But when I studied uh, the accounts or the history, earliest histories of uh, of Muslims, in particular of the Tabqat of uh, Ibn Saad who died in 230, uh, 210 Hijra, uh, 230 Hijra, then the Al-Ma'arif of Ibn Qutayba uh, and similarly uh, Tabari's uh, Tariq. I found, these are the three earliest of Muslim histories, I found that there was an absolutely lack of corroboration from these accounts. And when I say this, I say this because that all these books, in particular the Tabqat of Ibn Sa'd, it mentions the biographies of all the famous companions. It mentions the biographies of people who figure in the collection of the Quran narratives, people like Usman, people like Umar. Uh, similarly, we find Hafsa. We find people who had been assigned the task of collecting the Quran, like Zaid ibn Sabit, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and others. We have biographies of all these people. We have the biography of Hosefa ibn al Yaman, the famous general of uh, Usman, who had actually reported differences in reading the Quran. But, what fails to find mention in all the biographies of all these people in these books is that they had nothing to do with any collection of the Quran role which they have alleged to play in our Hadith books. So this, this is a question which, which became a question mark in my mind that why is it that Hadith books report a collection and transmission story or history of the Quran and this collection and transmission history should have been should have found mention in our history books as well because these history books actually 
they, 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 they relate and narrate the biographies of people who were involved in collecting and transmitting the Quran. But when we find these people being mentioned in our history books, in particular, I'm referring to the collection of the Quran narratives and the people who were involved in this in the times of Abu Bakr is Allah Anhu and Usman is Allah Anhu. We do not find that they had, these people had any role uh, which our Hadith books have, uh, have, have portrayed uh, regarding these, uh, these people. So this is my sixth question which arose uh, in that time. The seventh question which arose uh, in my mind was that the chains of narration of, our, um, of these collection of the Quran narratives are extremely weak. And they, more often than not, in most cases, they hinge on a single narrator, a single person from whom it is disseminated. In the first couple of tiers, it is narrated by single people. Now, it is a very common uh, established norm of historical criticism that when things of uh, all pervasive nature are mentioned by a few individuals, then they come to question. When the nature of something is such that it has to be transmitted or it should have been transmitted by many people, but we find just a single person narrating it and after him a single person narrating him as well, then it comes to question that this, did this event actually take place or not? Because if it had taken place, there would have been multiple people reporting the same word, the same event. Whereas in most cases, as I shall point out in my later lectures and talks, that they all hinge upon people, single people and single strands who report, uh, who report these narratives. So it is the weak nature of this transmission that struck me when I was doing my research. The eighth question which arose in my mind was that there is a serious and a severe difference in the reporting of the collection in the, of the Quran in the Sunni and the Shiite books. We have absolutely different Sunni and Shiite accounts of the collection of the Quran. The Sunni accounts regarding the collection of the Quran have a different version of this collection and the Shiite accounts which are primarily based on the Kitab of Sulaim ibn Qais, Tabrasiz al-Ihtajaj and Ali ibn Ibrahim al-Qummi, Tafsir al-Qummi. Uh, these, uh, the way these books describe the collection of the Quran and obviously they point out that it was Ali عنه, who was the first person who had collected the Quran and he brought it over to the, to the, to the Sahaba, the companions who were gathered at the Saqifah of Bani Sa'idah, uh, busy in electing the next caliph or the successor of the Prophet, uh, when he had come over to them and presented the Quran, which, he, which was with him, and he had said that it was given to him by the Prophet and he had collected it and he, had, uh, he has brought this before them. But it was not accepted by the companions, as the Shiite sources say. And the Sunni sources, on the other hand, present a very incomplete picture and uh, they reject this, uh, or they, they have a different version of how Ali was involved in this collection of the Quran. And according to them, it was Abu Bakr anhu who after the death or demise of the Prophet, when there was a battle uh, of Yamama going on between Musaylam ibn Khazab and a number of reciters of the Quran had died, did he embark upon the first collection of the Quran as he was advised by Umar anhu. So we find two conflicting versions in two of the mainstream sects of Muslims. Now, uh, the ninth question which arose in my mind was that a famous companion of the Prophet, Abdullah Abu Masood, uh, he is someone who was very close to the Prophet, one of his uh, earliest companions. Now, he is a person from whom you could least expect what I'm going to just narrate before you. He said that the Mu'avvizatayn, or the last two surahs of the Quran, Surah Falak and Surah Nas, they are not, they do not belong to the Quran. It was his view that these are not, these two surahs were not part of the Quran. And uh, as uh, it is, has been reported, that Kana Abdullah Yahukul Mu'avvizatayn min Masahifihi, that he would delete the Mu'avvizatayn, the last two surahs of the Quran from the Masahif, where Yaqul innahuma laysata bin kitab Allahi tabarak wa ta'ala. And he would say, that these are not, they do not belong to the Book of God. So this is what Abdullah ibn Masood would say, as has been recorded by our Hadith books. Now, uh, the tenth question which arose in my mind was regarding the arrangement of the surahs in the companion codices. Now, as you can see, uh, the, the uh, order of the Quran 
Quranic surahs in Abdullah ibn Masood's codex and of uh, Ubay ibn Kaab's codex is being displayed before you. And this has been brought to surface by Ibn Nadim al-Fahrist and uh, Suyuti al Khan. And they have displayed uh, this arrangement in their own books and said that this is how the Quran was arranged in the companion codices. Again, this question uh, struck me that uh, if uh, the Quran had a different arrangement in different companions and the Quran of Usman again had a different arrangement, then which is the correct arrangement? Why should we give up the arrangement of the other Sahaba and we stick to the arrangement which is found in the, in the uh, codex of Usman? So we, the numbers that you see viewers being displayed before you are the numbers which are found, uh, are the number of the surahs, they, they represent, each number represents a surah in the Usmanic codex. So these numbers actually are the surahs which are the Usmanic surahs and the way they have been arranged in the in these two uh, codices uh, of Abdullah bin Masood and Ubay ibn Kaab respectively, you can see how starkly this arrangement is different in their codices. Now, the 11th question uh, which struck my mind is uh, that uh, the orthography of the Quran or the orthographic history of the Quran in which vowel sounds and diacritics were inserted and the way it has been mentioned, it actually belies common sense. And uh, the history which is generally recorded in uh, various uh, orthography books is that the vowel sounds were in the, uh, first of all it is said that the text written, the earliest text was devoid of vowel sounds and was also devoid of diacritics. For thus, and that would mean that uh, the way a word should be pronounced and the way a word actually is, similar words which are which differ with each other by, uh, by a virtue of diacritics, this would not be available, it would not be apparent in that skeletal text. Skeletal text. It, it is said that the vowel sounds were inserted first and then later on in the times of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, it, the diacritics were inserted. So Abul Asfad al duali is the person who first inserted the vowel sounds and later on, about two or three decades later, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf in his time summoned some of the other people who actually uh, then inserted diacritics. Now the common sense question which came to my mind is that should it not have been the reverse because diacritical marks or the nukat, they are an inseparable part of a letter. It, if at all in any, any insertion had to be made, it should have been the diacritics which should have, should have come first and then later on these uh, vowels would, should have come because merely inserting the vowels and not being able to differentiate between a ra and a za and a ta and a za and a sin and a sheen or a sa and a sha, what good would have been vowel sounds? What good have been the arab if in the absence of these diacritics the Qurans could still be read in various uh, ways? So in my mind the history of this, uh, 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 history of the orthography of the Quran, the script of the Quran uh, presented a very very strange question. To me, the diacritics should have been inserted first and then sh these uh, vowel sounds should have been inserted, if at all the story, the way it has been narrated in our books is, is true. So this is what the, the question that struck my mind and it, it formed the 11th question. Now the 12th question which, which struck my mind and which uh, also caused doubt in my mind was that famous narrative, which most of you would be knowing, is the revelation of the Quran on seven ahruf. It is said that the Quran has been revealed on seven ahruf, and this again, uh, this narrative is found in Bukhari, it is found in Mu'atta, it is found in it, its, its variations are so many that most of our scholars regard this narrative to be mutawatir. They say that it is a mutawatir hadith, and strangely, no, not a single person is is in a position to decipher what actually is the meaning of this narrative. We find uh, different opinions, a plethora of opinions, people citing over thirty interpretations of this narrative and a person of the caliber of Imam Suyuti has said that this narrative is among the Matashabihat, the meaning of which is only known to God and viewers this narrative is one of the basic narratives in Muslim transmission and collection Quran history because it is this narrative uh, on the basis of which multiple readings of the Quran are accommodated and allowed and lo and behold we find, we find that our, our Muslim scholars they are not, they, are, they have different opinions regarding this, uh, this uh, narrative. When they say, when it is said that the Quran was revealed on seven ahruf, 
it is we are we are not in a position to definitely say what is R of means and what the the word or the letter seven or the number seven refers to. Thus, for example, some very common uh, interpretation is that some people say that the seven ahruf are seven ways of pronouncing a word. Some say that there are seven types of Quranic verses. This is what the meaning of seven ahruf is. Other people say that seven denotes seven dialects of Arabia. Some other people say that seven Arab denotes seven different types of Quranic verses and so on and so forth. And we have even uh, scholars who say that it denotes seven synonyms of the Quran. So there are so many different versions of interpretation of this narrative and it is so central to the collection and transmission of the history of the Quran and finding so much diverse opinions and people who have, have different opinions regarding this narrative and still accepting it to be a central narrative um, in the collection and transmission of the history of the Quran in spite of uh, uh, accepting the fact that we are not very sure what it means is again something which really uh, dumbfounded me. Finally, viewers, my 13, the 13th question, and I would say that this is, these are some of the questions which I am citing before you. There are several others as well which came to my mind, but these are some of the ones which I would, have, which I would present before you. So the final question which came to my mind was that we are generally introduced uh, and told that the Quran was to, transmitted in such a manner that there were thousands of memorizers of the Quran. There were heaps and uh, there, were, there were such a large number of people who had memorized the Quran partially and completely. And then it, these memorizers had transmitted this, this memorized Quran to the next generation and so on and so forth. And such was this large number of memorizers of the first generation in the time of the Prophet that any transmission in, of, of error uh, was rendered as secure. But on the contrary, we find a Muslim Hadith book as highly regarded as the uh, Jamia Sahih of Imam Bukhari presenting two narratives which, which say that actually there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. And uh, this is obviously in stark contrast with the claim that there were thousands of memorizers. The words of this, of this narrative as uh, recorded uh, in, in, in the Jamia Sahih of Imam Bukhari are, uh, it is reported by Anas ibn Malik. He says, Matan Nabi, Walam Yajmail Quran, Gairu Arba. And then he names those four persons Abu Darda, Mu'az ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Sabat, Abu Zayd. So it says that these are the four people. Only it's, it, it, the, the, the style is very restrictive. It says, Lam Yajmail Quran, Gairu Arba. Only three, four people had memorized the Quran. I'm saying memorized because most of our scholars interpret this narrative, the word jam'a, to be to connote memorization. So, in the presence of this narrative, that only four narrative, uh, no people had memorized the Quran, the claim that thousands and thousands of memorizers were there who had memorized the Quran and then transferred it to the next generation, this 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 contradiction has to be resolved. Uh, either the first one is correct or this is correct. So again, this was a question that, uh, that struck my mind and it, it, it uh, urged me to find what the truth was. So viewers, this is, this is a summary of some of the questions which I have presented before you. And inshallah, uh, in the next session, I will uh, further elaborate on how I have uh, taken upon myself to research out these questions. And I will also outline the methodology of my research also give the justification and the nature of my research and also present a summary of the topics that I will cover uh, in my later lectures. And I pray to God that he grant me the, the sagacity and the wisdom and the power of speech to properly present these, uh, these, this research before you. And I also pray to God that this research, in this research, whatever truth has come to my mind, that I, would, I should accept it the way it has come before me. And I also pray to God that this truth which I propagate, I shall always be flexible, that if any critique comes upon it uh, and convinces me, I shall change my opinion and always try and see what the truth is in this regard.